So today I'm just going to talk about our Savannah restoration project here on Guess Angling Wildlife Management Area. Uh, I'll talk about where we've been, uh, what's been done, and what where we're headed with it. Um, kind of where we're going to go today is I'm going to start with a brief overview of the Parks and Wildlife Mission Statement, the Wildlife Division Mission Statement, and then give you a quick introduction to Guess Angling Wildlife Management Area, the history of it, the goals of it, just briefly what we do. I'm going to touch on just quick wildlife management 101 and then dive into our Savannah Restoration Project. I'll take you from our pilot scale project and the initial planning phases to the phase two, our continued management, where we're going with our grazing development, and we'll wrap up with some time for questions there at the end. So the Parks and Wildlife Department, the mission statement is to manage and conserve the natural and cultural resources of Texas and provide hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation opportunities for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. Parks and Wildlife Department is made up of 12 different divisions. I work for the Wildlife Division within, within Parks and Wildlife. And our Wildlife Division mission statement is to foster on the ground conservation of diverse native wildlife and their habitats through sound science and land stewardship for the benefit of the resource and our hunting and outdoor heritage. So things that fall within that mission are population surveys, management recommendations to landowners, managed wildlife management areas, public hunting and public outreach, technical guidance, and then research as well. So good thingling. Wildlife Management Area falls into that underneath our Middle Trinity River Ecosystem Project. The Middle Trinity River Ecosystem Project is an umbrella that manages five different WMAs. Uh, we really are active on four of those. The Gus Engling WMA in Anderson County, it's just over 11,000 acres, primarily post oak savanna and bottom of hardwood forest. We also manage the Richland Creek WMA in Preestone and Navarro counties that are over 14,000 acres, uh, Trinity River Bottomland Hardwood Forest, and constructed wetland cells on the Fred Trist unit. The Big Lake Bottom WMA is actually just over 4,200 acres, um, on completely in the Trinity River Bottomlands. Uh, it's Bottomland Hardwood Forest. It's a gorgeous piece of property that we have there on the on the banks of the Trinity River. And then Keechaw Creek WMA down in Leon County, it's about 1,500 acres. Again, pristine bottom of hardwood forest at the confluence of the Keechaw and Buffalo Creeks there in Leon County. Uh, the one that I don't really mention is Cedar Creek Islands up there on Cedar Creek Reservoir. Uh, those are just a set of islands and a bird rookery within the reservoir that uh, really just manages itself. There's no active management going on up there on that WMA. Ghost Angling WMA was acquired and developed under the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, or the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. At that point in time, the Texas Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission purchased just over 10,000 acres between 1950 and 1952 from the Dearden family. Therefore, the WMA was originally named the Dearden WMA. Shortly after the property was acquired and the first biologist was stationed here, who was Gus Angling, uh, Unfortunately, Gus Engling was killed by a waterfowl poacher in the course of his duties in 1952. Um, shortly after that, the WMA was renamed to, in his honor, um, as being the first biologist out here, the first one to start working on Gus Engling. Part of his act, and we'll read some of this history here in just a minute, was getting an overview of what this area looked like to set forth what our management was going to look like on the WMA. In that time period when the department was buying properties, they were setting up these large research and demonstration sites across the entire state. So good thing like that for the post oak savanna. We have the chaparral down in South Texas, the Kerr in the hill country. We have the matador up in the panhandle and others across the state that are set in these big ego regions that we have across the state managed as research and demonstration sites on how to effectively manage these habitats and how to demonstrate that to landowners and take that successful management to show it off. The WMA itself covers just over 11,000 acres. We have about 2,000 acres of bottomland hardwood floodplain on the Catfish Creek drainage. Uh, the Catfish Creek drainage is a national natural landmark, so it's in decently pristine condition. It's um, 
high quality bottomland forest, uh, bottomland area that has very, had had very little influence of uh, man-made impacts and man-made urbanization within it. We have about 500 acres of natural watercourses or riparian areas, spring-fed creeks and branches that cross the WMA, about 350 acres of wetlands, marshes and open swamps, about 300 acres of sphagnum peat moss bogs that are very endemic to this site and certain sites that are similar in East Texas. And then about 2,500 acres of restored savanna. Uh, so we're going to focus in on that 2,500 acres of the restored savanna and how we got there um, for the duration of this. The overarching goals for how we manage Gus Engling are to develop and manage wildlife habitats and populations of indigenous wildlife species. We provide a site where research wildlife populations and habitat is able to be conducted under controlled conditions, uh, provides us a really good, strong spot where we can do research with manipulated spots and unmanipulated spots and get good comparisons um, as to what we are, uh, what we're doing, how we're affecting these habitats. We provide areas to demonstrate habitat development and wildlife management practices to landowners and other interest groups. We preserve unique natural sites and relic vegetation communities like those peat moss bogs that I've mentioned. We provide public hunting and appreciative use opportunities in a manner that's compatible with the resource and provide access to educational groups, naturalists, and other professional biological investigators. And protect populations of endangered, threatened, or migratory wildlife, wildlife and protect plant species and related habitats. So with those goals in mind, that drives all of the different activities that we do. Our primary charge, again, is research and demonstration. So everything that we do on the ground we try to put back out to the public in some form or fashion. This webinar is a great way. We do landowner days. We have school groups come out. We have university groups come out. We have interested landowner groups that come in and go through different seminars. We offer First Friday habitat tours where somebody can come and climb in the truck with myself or our other biologists here on the property and go right around the area and talk about what management they want to do um, and really show them how we do that here on the ground. We manage the habitat extensively. We've got an extensive prescribed burning program. Uh, we're always got something moving, something happening, something going on on the ground, manipulating and changing habitat for the indigenous wildlife that are here. We conduct population and habitat surveys, uh, surveys all throughout the year, everything from browse to mass production to squirrel surveys to our regulatory white-tailed deer surveys. Um, you name it, we try to keep a number on it. Education and outreach and in public use. The area is open the vast majority of the year, um, whether it's public hunting or whether it's just open to hiking, bird watching, fishing, uh, nature trails, et cetera. We keep the gates open. We want the public out here using this place and seeing, um, seeing the management that we're doing and the benefits that we're putting on the ground. So I mentioned the post oak savanna eco region. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that looks like across the state of Texas, it's this little bitty narrow band that covers eight and a half million acres within the state, spans across 32 counties, has nine major rivers that cross it and feed it in some form or fashion. The soils are sandy to sandy loam, um, a lot of infiltration. Uh, here we sit over the Carrizo Wilcox aqu aquifer, so it helps in recharging that. Um, then the topography is classified as gently rolling topography. So you may ask, has the post oak savanna really changed? Um, I referenced that Gus Engling, when he was here, he went through and wrote up a history of what this area looked like uh, pre-settlement. And these descriptions that I'm going to give you right here come out of that work. So in the early 1800s, settlers reported that trees were large and scattered with waist-high grasses in the uplands. Deer and cattle could be seen for several hundred yards, even in the bottomlands, um, and described as park-like conditions. Wagons could be driven to the banks of Catfish Creek, so it wasn't infested and grown up with brush and briars. You could comfortably get down there to the banks of the creek. In those earlier times, frequent fires, grazing of bison, and robust wildlife populations helped maintain these conditions. And that picture on the right 
side of the screen is from 1966. You can see that some of that underbrush is coming back up. You see a more dense uh, canopy of trees there in the background, but we still have that high presence of those waist high grasses that were described. In the late 1800s, barbed wire fences and roads made those fires easier to control. So we started moving the fire off that landscape. We started taming this area um, along with fires being easier to control. Wildlife populations started to decline and decrease. By the early 1900s, noticeable undergrowth was everywhere. Uh, it was described as being waist high. A lot of those were solid stands of oaks and hickories. Um, since the 1930s, we really saw the greatest increase in brush and undergrowth. Uh, Catfish Creek also widened into marshes, has grown up in the cut grass and elm and willow. Those are still problems that we're battling today. So it went from a, a more centralized deep channel creek to wide open meandering, really kind of shifted what the bottom one looks like. By the 1950s, much of the uplands were dominated by stands of oaks and hickories. The bottomlands had closed in with brush and briars. And conversions of habitat due to timber harvest and improved pasture grasses and farming really started to shift the rest of that landscape. Uh, I mentioned the wildlife populations that were here. Most of those were extirpated by market hunting in the 1920s, thus requiring that over time as we started to restore this area that we had to do everything from species reintroductions, everything from white-tailed deer to beavers to turkeys and quail. Uh, so just to recover from the big changes that we had. Um, so just real briefly on wildlife management, how we make the decisions on how we manage the land. Um, we manage the land by using disturbance. Disturbance is a natural process. We're out there physically changing what's on the ground. We're doing something to manipulate the vegetation in order to set back succession, to change the structure, to change the composition of it. Uh, we use a number of different forces uh, trying to mimic what nature did. Nature had many forces that they used as well. So fire, grazing, floods, droughts, any of these catastrophic events would have changed what was on the landscape and they changed what was available to the species that were living here. A lot of the decisions that I make when we're planning habitat practices or that we're doing something on the WMA is driven by this quote from Aldo Leopold and Game Management. Um, the central thesis of game management is this. Game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. Axe, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So that really set forth our really set forth our toolbox and the options that we have in order to manage it to set the disturbance in the ground and to change it. You can take game out of that quote and you can put in whatever species, whatever landscape, whatever you want to focus on, but we still have the same tools to manage the lands and to manage the disturbance in order to affect these ecosystems and restore them back to what we want them to be. Paul, I saw that you had a hand raised. Oh, I think it's okay, go ahead. Okay. So when we're managing the land, we're managing vegetation, we're managing plant succession. Succession is a natural process that's clear and predictable. We know that, that if we go do X practice, we're reasonably going to get this outcome. And then over time, it's going to shift back to this. And that's the driver of making our habitat management decisions uh, that allows us to sit there and say, okay, we want to go harvest timber and set it back to a grassland. And if we get it back to a grassland, how is that going to change over time? What management activities do we need to put in place on the ground to keep it in this more productive site, this earlier successional stage? Um, late successions, not always better for wildlife habitat. In the later succession stages, we have decreased plant diversity, we have decreased animal diversity, and increased concern across the board. I think we're seeing that across the nation as a whole. Uh, looking at the decrease in the native grasslands we've got. We're seeing the thickization of more forests, more brush coming in, lack of fire um, that's really pushing it towards those later succession habitats. And we're losing a lot of these earlier succession species. They're of increased concern. So we've got to do something to set those back. We've got to manage 
uh, manage those lands in order to benefit those species and set them back, move them into those earlier stages. So we reach into our toolbox, uh, that act, cow, plow, fire, and gun. And the way we do it now is prescribed burning, prescribed grazing, uh, moist soil management in the bottom ones. We have mechanical means, whether that's cutting timber, whether that's mulching right of ways, uh, chemical means, using herbicide in order to open areas, in order to reduce brush, to reduce canopy. Um, and then if need be, native gra grass reseedings and plantings to restore those systems in really, really disturbed settings. Um, so this is just some of the work that we've done on the WMA. Everything from the timber harvest that we're gonna dive into, we burn thousands of acres. Um, in my time here, on average, we try to get about 3,000 acres of the WMA burn, so about a third of it. Um, we've done thousands of acres of herbicide application. We've constructed wetlands and managed to manipulate those, um, mulching and creating right-of-ways, clearing underbrush to give us a better chance at getting successful prescribed burns um, there on the ground. We've created miles and miles of right-of-ways that are held in herbaceous states, um, herbaceous states to provide travel corridors, to provide natural food plots, um, and to open up really thick areas and, again, improve our prescribed burning as we've gone through. So just a brief overview, kind of a 30,000-foot view of what we do on the WMA, what kind of drives us. Um, now I want to drive into our Savannah restoration project. I mentioned earlier that it's still ongoing. It's not fully complete yet because we haven't put everything into place. Uh, the culmination of the Savannah restoration is really going to come in whenever we get livestock back grazing across this 2,500 acres. So it's taken probably now closer to over 20 years of planning. Um, Numerous biologists have put in on this, numerous wildlife technicians and project leaders have put in effort and brain power to get this project planned, get it implemented, and ultimately get it completed. Uh, it focused on 2,500 acres of the WMA. We call it our Northwest section. Um, the process to get the restoration there is timber removal and herbicide. We wanted to really demonstrate how effective that could be by removing the timber, by using a little bit of herbicide and ultimately using prescribed burning in order to manage what we restored and where we removed the timber, um, how we could effectively restore these oak savannas, how we can manage them, and how we can get that message out there. Um, everything we do right now is really driven by prescribed burning because burning is our most effective tool. It's our most natural tool that we have, and it's also the most most um, cost-effective tool that we have out there. When you think about the time, the effort that went in to remove the timber or the time and effort that goes into shredding and mowing or spraying herbicide, prescribed burning beats that all the way across the board. So our project goals on our pilot scale project was to restore the grassland component in an oak-dominated upland. We wanted to reduce the canopy cover down to about 40% from roughly 94%. Uh, we wanted a 60% native grassland component. We were gonna protect 15 acre clop, clumps or mots and protect, protect the riparian areas. Uh, you can see in that picture kind of the, what we were going for with the 1960 Savannah. Um, the picture on the bottom there is the similar state. Uh, I think that picture was taken in 2009 or 2011. So you can see how far it had come, how far it had degraded into an oak woodland from the savanna component that we truly wanted. In order to get this done, we had to go and partner with an NGO. We had to work with the National Wild Turkey Federation to steward a contract so that we could get timber pulled off the landscape, um, and be able to have follow-up management, be able to handle the timber and how we we're gonna get that moved, how we we're gonna get it, um, how we were gonna generate those funds and be able to put those funds back onto the ground um, here on the WMA and it not. So NWTF was a huge, huge partner for us. They were an escrow agent for the money. They actually 
helped us and hired a forestry con, uh, consultant that we were able to write the contract for. We were able to use them to find a contractor and help manage this project overall. We were a good work site for them and they were a good contract administration for us. So just a little before and afters, uh, here's a photo point, July 2009. Here it was post logging. Uh, the pilot scale project harvest actually took place in 2010. So this is a couple of years after that initial harvest. You can see that we removed a ton of the timber. We opened up the canopy. It was a very radical change, um, but I, following that initial harvest, uh, we were left with a ton of tops laid out there. We had a lot of logging debris and slash piles left to clean up. We had a lot of follow-up work after that. Five years later, March of 2017, here's what that looks like. It's a lot closer to that picture that we had in the early 1800s of waist-high grasses, trees, and few and far between. The big tree line in the back of the picture is one of those 15-acre mocks that we had left. And here's where it is, June of 2019. This is after a series of herbicide applications, after a couple of rounds of prescribed fire, and where it sits in a pretty similar state today. So this would have been recently after a burn, a winter burn there in 2019. Uh, still a good sea of grasses. We got a little bit of brush coming up, which is not, not a bad thing. It adds to diversity. Uh, you can see the big mop back there and then trees are starting to see, starting to thin out um, as a result of our burning and our herbicide applications. I threw this in here because it's a good aerial view from Google Earth. Uh, so this is the Northwest section in its entirety prior to any logging. So this is August of 2008 when this image was taken. And you ask yourself whether we really made a big change um, on the landscape, and we did. So you can see where that pilot scale project took place. You see that that dense overstory of timber was harvested and trimmed back. We have our 15 acre mocks. We have our riparian drainage that is there. Um, that we protected and we kept, we kept the timber in there uh, to protect the water quality to protect any streams that were there and then to just maintain the continuity of those riparian areas. The circles were never truly intended to be circles. Uh, those were placeholders in GIS, but the biologist that was here at the time marking the timber, marking the circles, had the map, had the GPS coordinates, went out and mark them as perfect circles. Uh, we always mention that because unfortunately, that biologist, his name was Wes Luttrell, he was um, killed in a tractor accident out here on the WMA. So it's, um, it's a good way to remember him and the work that he did out here. Uh, but those circles were just placeholders. Those are the mocks. We were trying to protect those areas, but it's just funny that we wound up with perfect circles um, in that pilot scale project. So that pilot scale covered just 460 some odd acres of the uh, of that entirety of the 2,500 acre targeted restoration section. Following the pilot scale project, we sat there and evaluated the success of the project. We looked at what we learned from administering it. We looked at the change on the ground. We looked at how we would need to move forward to make it successful um, in the phase two. Uh, and we really kind of shifted our goals and we shifted what we wanted to see from doing a clear cut and leaving just a handful of trees and select mocks to doing a timber thinning. So phase two focused on the rest of the area, about 2,000 acres, um, and shifted to a timber thinning. So the goals were still roughly the same. We still wanted to restore the grassland component in an oak woodland. We wanted to reduce the canopy cover. We wanted to establish a mobile fire line. We wanted to protect our riparian areas. Um, and we de delineated all of this in-house and continued our partnership with um, the NWTF to administer this 
project as well. So again, the goals were revised. After we saw the amount of input and the effort that it took to get that first 400 acres to that true grassland, the number of herbicide applications that we put in, the prescribed burn effort that it took to keep it and maintain it in that grassland component, we decided that we wanted to try to capture a more true savanna. Um, we wanted to reduce our basal area from about 100 to 120 square feet down to roughly 35 to 40 square feet on average, uh, restore the herbaceous understory, and again, protect those riparian areas. Uh, those, the scope of this project covered a couple more spring-fed branches um, and a couple of lakes that we have here on the property. So the, protecting those riparian areas was pretty important. Here's just some before and afters. Uh, so one point in July of 2011, you can see closed canopy, dense brush, not much understory vegetation there, no true native grasses sitting there. Um, pretty pretty thick, shaded, unproductive. This is post thinning in 2016. This would have been right after the loggers had come through. Much more open canopy. We're seeing a little bit of a brush response down on the bottom. But now we've got sunlight hitting the soil surface that will allow those native grasses to respond. Same site in 2019. You can really see that the brush has been knocked back. You can see those native grasses and forbs starting to really come in, really start to dominate that understory and start to capture the image that we really want to see out there on the landscape. So the process to get there, uh, we hired a logger. It was a kind of an operator select. We didn't go out and delineate every tree that he needed to cut. The trees that they wanted to cut were the ones that were going to be beneficial to us. They wanted the most marketable timber. Um, they wound up leaving us with some of the bigger, gnarlier, good mass producing trees. So it was a benefit all the way around. Um, for where we're at in the mills, the um, Getting marketable timber was tough because of our distance from the mills, from our habitat type. But where the benefit came in to the loggers was that they had a place to work in the winters when it was wet. They couldn't be in the bottoms harvesting the pine timber. Uh, so it gave them somewhere to work year-round. Whenever they couldn't get into pine timber, they could shift over here and harvest this. We started the timber thinning uh, late 2015 and wrapped it up in a couple of seasons by March of 2017. Again, we sit there and ask, how much did we change it? Here's that same photo from Google Earth in October of 2012. You can see the pilot scale project uh, up there in the top left corner. And then now we're talking about the vast majority of everything and kind of the top right down to the center part of that picture. Here it is in 2017. You can see that we have our two lakes up on the far north end. There's a timber line that was delineated and protected up there around those. And then kind of here in the center of the picture was our other riparian corridor, uh, spring-fed branch that runs all the way across that section that was protected and delineated. Uh, we flipped back to the 2012 image, you can see how tight the closed canopy, how densely treed it was, that there was a lot of leaf area covering that habitat versus 2017. You can see that we really opened things up, um, especially down here in kind of the southwestern portion of it, up here through the center of it, uh, just made a big shift, big change on the landscape using the timber thinning to get us a foothold uh, for our future management. So our continued management, uh, we started with our canopy reduction. We built the fire line uh, all the way around the exterior of that area. It measured about 5.3 miles at 75 foot wide so that we could safely and effectively burn this area at the different fuel loads and the different uh, fuel types that we now have on the ground. Uh, we did over 2,000 acres of a herbicide application just targeting the understory regrowth and the response of the oaks and hickories coming back. The um, pilot scale project itself had undergone 
I think, four different herbicide applications from a broadcast to a IPT, an individual plant treatment uh, targeting that, that brushy response. The thin sections have only undergone one large-scale broadcast treatment. Uh, we did targeted treatments um, on 50 to 60 acres in a couple of spots and just areas that had gotten really thick. And then ultimately we're moving towards reintroducing grazing, uh, working on getting a grazing plan written with our local NRCS grazing specialist. Um, that way we can put cattle back on this restored savanna. We can manage it with the full suite of those tools, but always keeping prescribed burning at our forefront and always keeping our wildlife management at the forefront. The tool, the burning, the herbicide, the timber thinning, the grazing is all part of the suite of tools that we're using um, to drive our wildlife management, and really fitting within the goals of the property and where we're going with it. Um, part of the logging, part of the thinning, we had a number of slash piles that were created that most of them measured a square acre at 15 to 20 foot high. Um, we had to go in and burn those and clean those up. Uh, we didn't wind up having to reseed any of those or any of this area. Uh, so that's what this picture is showing. It's just one of those logging piles, slash piles, uh, that was centrally located that's burning. Then we now have these little one and a half, two acre open areas um, with really no tree canopy that have been maintained um, over the last few years with our prescribed burns, just a, a wide open herbaceous area. And then follow-up prescribed burns um, after the thinning to further clean the area, to reset it, um, and what will be the biggest tool in our management that we have that we will ultimately wind up pairing with our, um, our grazing plan as we continue moving forward. So I've mentioned grazing a number of times. I've mentioned that we have partnered with our local NRCS grazing specialist to develop this plan. What I basically did was took these 2,500 acres, I handed it to him on a plate and said, develop your ideal grazing plan. Um, know that we have wildlife management that's got to be at our forefront. We've got prescribed burning that's got to be at our forefront. And we've got public hunting that we've got to work around. Um, so having those constraints, he sat down and developed, developed a plan um, that will allow us to reintroduce grazing into the savanna, it's going to take some development of fire lines, of fence lines, of water lines, of water trough locations that are going to be dual purpose. They're going to benefit wildlife on the landscape. They're also going to aid in our, uh, our cattle operations as well um, and really kind of be the end piece to the savanna restoration. And then it's going to open up numerous opportunities for research and demonstration as we continue to move forward. Um, and part of what this is also going to allow us to do is break the savanna down from managing it in chunks of 400 acres or 700 acres down into smaller blocks. Um, the ultimate goal that we want to wind up with is managing this as a patch burn grazing system. So we're, we want to break this 2,000 acres, 2,500 acres down into average of 60 acre blocks and manage them at a smaller scale and truly create a patchwork diversity through there um, by burning different areas at different times of the year, by having the cattle grazing different areas at different times of the year, and really moving those two, those two tools across the landscape to create a patchwork to really increase the diversity, to change the plant composition that we're out there, to benefit all of the wildlife um, and the landscape as a whole. So it's a it's a pretty wide open blank slate. I'm excited for where it's going. Um, our other biologist, Kyle Hamm, was in the office today working on some background work to get our water lines and our fencing and our fire lines cleared so we can start putting those in and we can start implementing these. Uh, but this is where we're driving full force. The thinning's completed. The herbicide applications on a large scale have been completed. We're driving towards breaking these units down and managing them in smaller scales. Um, and then driving towards putting cattle on the landscape. 
just some of the research that has gone on since the beginning of it. Uh, we had a seed bank viability and species composition study done at SFA to see if we needed to reseed. Uh, ultimately, they found that the seeds in the soil were able to reseed and generate themselves. So we didn't have to do any follow-up reseeding after any of the timber restoration. Everything came back natively and naturally. Uh, we've had breeding bird response studies done. We've had Eastern and Rio Grande wild turkey studies done. Um, reintroduced bobwhite quail on the, the landscape a couple of times with, let's say, marginal success. Um, quail are, as we all know, are birds born to die. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue to expand that project there in the future. Uh, the last release that we did was in 2021, um, and on call counts this last spring in 22, we did have, um, I think it was five birds that were documented on the call counts. That's the first time in a long time that we've had success on call counts here in Quail um, and know that they were likely linked to those um, those reintroduced, reintroduced released quail there in 21. Um, a lot of reptile and amphibian work. And then currently looking at the thicketization of oak savannas and how the restoration work could lead to uh, greater regional ground recharge. Big project with Texas A&M that's actively working right now. So a lot of different aspects. Um, again, like I mentioned with the introduction of the grazing and where we're going with that is going to open more doors for further research, further investigations into how effective this restoration work is and what it's doing on the landscape and how it's affecting everything that uses this habitat and then how we can demonstrate and get that message out. We've had a number of cooperators over the years. Um, NWTF was a big one, Audubon, NRCS, uh, Quail Unlimited, and Forest Service. Um, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we do here on the ground without these guys in some form or some fashion. Uh, so tip my hat and big thank you to them. And with that, this quick view of our restoration work, it's still ongoing, um, but we're wrapping things up and it, it's exciting to see where it's going. It's been a a fun eight years working here, and I can't wait to see where it goes in the future. And with that, Paul, I'm ready for questions. Yeah, fantastic, Kyle. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, there are a lot of questions uh, in the in the chat. So, uh, kind of questions and comments. I'll just read them out as we go, and you can you know elaborate and go into as much detail as you you like to. So, we made a comment here that said it might be nice to get some bison back is that i'm sure that's a little bit more logistically challenging but did that ever get discussed it has been discussed um we like to say that it's kind of our pie in the sky dream that we would i mean to bring full scale restoration back that would be the most logical sense that we bring bison back uh, we'll just have to see what those battles look like to try to get that done and if it ever was truly feasible to get that done yeah very good uh, can you elaborate on the moist soil management yeah so here we have um we have three constructed green tree reservoirs uh those were constructed in a partnership with ducks unlimited back in the very late 1980s, 1989, um, 1990, 91, that time frame in there span about 130 acres. Um, and we try to manage those as best we can to mimic the natural flood regimes that would occur there in the bottoms. Um, we've got a series of water control structures and an intake canal where we can pull water from Catfish Creek, flow it through those systems, and then um, flood those trees through the winter to provide wintering habitat for those migrating waterfowl, primarily wood ducks and mallards as we, um, as we roll through the winter and into the, uh, into the, the breeding season for them. Uh, most of the rest of the area that has 
marshes and stuff is just subject to natural uh, flooding events and overblank flooding from Catfish Creek. So we just have three units here that we manage. Uh, Richland Creek is a lot more constructed and built out for moist soil management, running through those annual cycles of drawdowns and flooding regimes to benefit benefit all the waterfowl species. That's great. There's lots of questions here about different herbicides. Um, <clears throat> first one is, can you explain what types of herbicides you used? Have you had any issues with herbicide resistant species? Have, uh, do you have a problem with KR? Um, I wonder if you could talk about that sort of herbicide stuff in that regard a little bit. Yeah, so generally, um, the herbicides that we used were all woody specific. Uh, we used a lot of triclopyr, uh, so Remedy is a good label name. Um, we've used some Tordon 22K, and we've used Amazapyr in limited amounts just because Amazapyr is a pretty good generalist. Uh, it'll kill everything. Uh, so I refrain from using that one a whole lot. Triclopyr has been the biggest one, especially when I talk about our broadcast treatments across the entirety of that area. Um, right after the thinning, we did, I think it wound up being 1,700 acres of just an understory treatment. So we hired a skitter to come out and treat the understory and treat the woody uh, brush that was responding and coming back. And for most of that, it was just a heavy triclopyr mix that was going to target the oaks and the hickories. We also know that we were going to lose a little bit of the woody forms, but those are going to respond quicker than the brush component that we we're targeting. Um, we did some tank mix of triclopyr and that Tordon 22K, which is picloram and some of the more open areas where we didn't have much concern for the um, the overstory. There wasn't much overstory in those areas that we put it out because that Tordon 22K has some soil activity. So we would have had some residual kill on the bigger trees. Um, so we use those in the more open areas, more areas that were still in a savanna-esque component across the area. Um, but most of, most all of the herbicide work has been woody specific. Uh, fortunately, up that way, the vast majority of it is native grasses and native plants. KR, we have a little bit on our, our major roadways um, and the bar ditches there associated with those roadways. We deal with some Bermuda, we deal with some Bahia encroachment, um, but in the areas where we've got dense, thick, native grasses and native plants, uh, the introduced grasses are not not much of a big problem. Most of it's in our heavily disturbed areas and our roadside areas. Uh, but our herbicide work, again, was just really targeted at getting us a jump start um, on responding to that brush coming back and the re-sprouting coming back after that initial thinning. Um, that way we don't, we didn't thin it and then turn around and have the re-sprouts get out of control before we could get prescribed fire on them. So it was just kind of an initial jump out there that's treat them early and then we'll follow up with prescribed burning. That's great. Thank you. And I think you said you did not reseed anywhere, right? There's a couple of questions about, about that. Correct. So I quickly mentioned that study with SSA. They came out and took a bunch of uh, soil samples and pulled out all the seeds and did some germination studies and found that the um, that there was a ton of viability still in the seeds in the native seed bank. So after after that was done, uh, we made the decision to cut the timber, let that sunlight get to the soil surface, and just see what was going to happen, thinking that we might have to follow up and reseed. But what we saw was within a year. Um, that the native grasses just exploded and came back once we had that canopy removed, we had the shading removed, and the sunlight was able to get down to the soil surface. Um, those grasses just came back, so we we hadn't had to reseed any portion of that um, restored savanna, and we found that to be true in other areas where we have opened up right away so we've opened up clearings um does the same thing the way that 
those seed banks were created and the intended purpose on them is you, you get them the elements that they need. They need that sunlight. They need that moisture. They need to have the reduced competition that they'll respond very favorably. Excellent. Um, how will you protect the riparian areas when you do the prescribed grazing? It looked like from your map, there was some fencing along the riparian areas. Yes, we will fence them out. Um, and we will hold those areas back um, from grazing with the exception of having um, some gates in there if we wind up in an emergency situation where our water well goes out and we wind up in trouble and we need water. Uh, but they will be ultimately fenced out. The cattle will not be allowed in their free choice. Um, there may be some instances where we do open them up and let them run in there. Uh, just for a short duration, a very short time period that's very tightly controlled. Um, we're, we're blessed here to have a number of spring-fed branches and uh, natural springs and things that feed these areas, so we're, we're really concerned with maintaining the quality of those systems and where they're at. Uh, we will prescribe burn across them, use them as fire breaks, uh, but as far as doing any other manipulation in there it's going to be very limited and then um after a burn how long before cattle grazing is recommended or kind of allowed on that patch again so we're in the process of developing that um and it'll really depend on what part of the area it's in we've got some sites that have really really deep sandy soils that are very not very productive overall. Uh, the duration post burn before graze will be longer there, um, but it'll, we're, we're kind of working through that and developing those parameters as we go and as we really dive into this. And I'm going to lean hard on our partners at uh, NRCS and, and there to really help us develop those guidelines and how we're going to manage those rotations. Awesome. Um, how does one see when seminars are being held at the WMA? And can you just show up for the Friday uh, landowner tours? Yeah, so the first Friday landowner tours, oh, they run April through September, the first Friday of every month. Um, honestly, the best way to do it is just get in contact with me and we can set up a tour whenever. If you want it to be that first Friday, that's great. Otherwise, uh, when we have landowner events and things, we develop a flyer and we send it out. Um, and we send it out to our district biologists and up through the region and disseminate it out um, within the department channels and a couple of groups that we're tied with. Uh, but if you're, you're interested, um, just shoot me an email or give me a call and I will, uh, I will start a list that and keep a list for whenever we've got things going on. That's awesome. Um, do you have a feral hog problem? And if so, how are you how are you dealing with that? Don't we all have a feral hog <laughs> problem? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of reprieve this last year, really. I I can't point to direct cause, but I think the freeze had a big part to do with it in 21 and then this drought really had a big part to do with it but we actively trap uh, we intensively trap uh, pigs here we got onto a system developed um, now I'm, I'm not promoting their system but they're they're good at it um, we use traps developed by Jaeger Pro and target whole sounder removal uh, so we trap extensively, we target the entire sounder, so removing that entire group of pigs, population of pigs in a given area, um, using using these large-scale traps. So they've got eight-foot wide remote trigger doors. The traps themselves are a 35-foot diameter circle. Um, if we get a group of pigs on, we bait them, we feed them, we get a specific count of numbers, we get them habituated to the trap site, um, and we don't drop that trap until the entire sounder is in 
in that trap. Um, if we don't have the entire sounder, we're not going to drop it because then we're educating other pigs. We've done that intensively for, I think, five years now. Um, we quit recreationally hunting them because we found that recreational hunting was ineffective at managing them um, and shifted to this trapping. And in the course of those five years, we've shot, we've trapped and shot and killed probably 1,300 or so pigs um, and really knocked their population back. Um, so we, we've got limited, limited damage, limited numbers right now, but we also had some environmental factors that have helped us with that. Um, but if, when they respond and they come back up, we'll pick our trapping efforts back up um, and continue on with this whole, whole sounder targeted trapping efforts. It's been the most effective way that we can handle them um, and not be educating pigs and not perpetuating the problem um, and increasing trap avoidance. Wow, that's a lot of pigs. Um, th we're kind of running out of time, but there's still a handful of questions. Carl, do you have another sort of five, 10 minutes just to work through them? There's some good questions here, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Um, you had mentioned about the, the sort of shape of the mop as an, you know, an artifact of the original GIS uh, design. Were there any other configurations that went into sort of, or any considerations that went into designing the mops, like you know, species diversity or anything like that, or they just kind of randomly put down on the on the landscape? I believe they were just randomly put on the landscape. Um, if we go back, bear with me. And I'll let those slides catch up. Um, they were really just randomly generated placeholders across the area. We knew that we wanted to protect some mops. Um, and when we had the, the original intent on that pilot scale project was that we were going to do a clear cut um, across that entire area and protect those riparian areas, protect some of those mots so that we did still have some pockets of thick timber out there to have that diversity. Um, ultimately, they were supposed to be irregular shaped. They're supposed to average 15 acres in size. Um, and they, the three that were protected in the pilot scale wound up being those perfect circles with their riparian area. Uh, but once we shifted from doing that clear cut and wanting to get into more of a the thinning um, and not have that intensive change from a dense thick oak forest to a true grassland, um, the mocks fell away because we were leaving more standing timber when we shifted to that the thinning mindset. So no, I. From what I've seen and looked at, they were just kind of placed and put out there. Um, some of it was probably due to topography and location, but I don't know that anything wound up being a um, specific species composition or timber composition or whatnot on the ground. Got it. Thank you. A um, couple of uh, game bird questions here. Is there a minimum track? size of savannah that you know of that will support a quail population? I don't have a good direct number off the top of my head. Okay. And um, you showed you show some pictures of turkeys in, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. have, you done, you, have you done turkey reintroductions? Is there a resident population currently? We have. Um, so the department's been doing turkey reintroductions for a large number of years. Uh, this latest round started in 2014 with the super stockings. Um, in 2014, we released 80 eastern birds out here and on a landowner north of us that met all the requirements. Um, they had the acreage, had the wildlife management. Uh, but there was 80 birds released here, and then we supplemented with um, Rio Grande's in 2016 and 2018. So those are the most recent reintroductions we've had out here. Uh, we run gobble count surveys every spring. We run a fall camera survey looking for poult production every August. Um, and we've seen that 
more and more birds on the ground, um, especially like post releases, we started seeing more birds without leg bands. Every bird that was released here had leg bands on them so we could know which were released, which were natively raised. Um, and starting to see the birds are holding their own. Um, I can't say that we have, we don't have good numbers to whether they're increasing, whether they're decreasing. We're seeing more poults, we're seeing birds in areas. Um, they seem to have really taken a foothold, like I said, just kind of holding their own. Um, but the, it's all results from the latest stocking in 14 and then supplemented in 16 and supplemented in 18. That's awesome. Um, question here about the the timber harvest. Um, when you were doing the work, did you did you were you harvesting the large trees or mid to small sized trees from overgrown or dense areas? Like what was the what was the strategy, and what would you recommend for people trying to replicate this? So the I came in whenever the thinning job started, um, but we were really just after reducing the overall basal area across the landscape. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that it was kind of an operator select. So we wanted the loggers to take out enough timber to meet the basal area requirements that we had, um, but we weren't out designating the exact trees or areas that they wanted, that we wanted them to harvest. Um, so the, the one that was running the feller buncher had the decisional capacity to take tree or leave a tree, um, based off what was marketable for, for the loggers themselves. Um, so that was kind of the, kind of the guideline was it was an operator select. He could cut what he thought would get be the most productive for them, uh, which worked well with us because they did wind up leaving some smaller diameter trees that'll recruit and it'll grow um, but it also wound up leaving some of the bigger gnarlier trees that um, had a higher wildlife value on them i see that's great like a, a mix of kind of uneven age then essentially yes yep that's that's great what species of native grass are dominant on the wma is it mainly little blue stem it is mainly little blue stem uh, we sit in kind of that mid grass region, so little blue stem, big blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass would all be out there would be the dominant. Um, across that savanna, largely think that just result of our management practices and the frequency of fire and the lack of grazing uh, has really favored um, little blue stem being truly dominant. Excellent. I'm looking here at the remaining questions. I think we may have hit them all. Yeah, I think that's everything, Kyle. Um, so, I mean, if, if uh, everybody could clap, I would recommend we do it. But thank you so much for the talk. Uh, this has been super informative. I know we have a, this has been a mix of uh, all sorts of different audiences. I recognize some of the names on here from landowners that we we work with in the post oak savanna. So I think we've, we've yeah you've hit a bunch of different people here with some really cool information, um, and I appreciate the education myself.